Welcome from Ultimate Road Trips. From a very, very nice sunny Sunday afternoon, which means it's time to get the fun cars out. I'm going to take out my Z4M Roadster. I don't think we've shown her yet on any of the videos we've done. She is my pride and joy. This is a 2006 Z4M Roadster, or Z4M, for anyone watching in America. Mine has covered only 38,741 miles, which actually isn't low mileage, but I think it shows that I've enjoyed driving the car, which is important because I think I always sort of see these cars for sale and instead of done sort of 10 or 15,000 miles over 10 years and you sort of think well has the person actually enjoyed using it? I thoroughly enjoy going out in this and although it is only high days and holidays I generally will always try and make sure that I go out and drive it for a good sort of couple of hours, half a day, take it out for the day and enjoy it. That's what these cars are for. I cannot stand a dirty car so it pretty much has only been driven in the dry but now it comes out on high days and holidays. So we're going to rig up the GoPro. We're going to have a little chat about the Z4M Roadster, why I brought it, why I've still got it, and what I love most about it. So let's get going. Before we go, let's just get a bit of exhaust noise because one of the nice things about the one of, the, one of the really great things about the Z4M Roadster is that metallic-y raspy noise we get from the exhaust. <laughs> right, it's time to stop vlogging and start driving. So, Z4M Roadster. This is probably the oldest car we've done a vlog about, to be honest. 2006. She's just had her 10th birthday on the 16th of May after my birthday but I wouldn't ever think about passing with her I see some of the prices of Z4M Roadsters are going up not as quite as much as the coupes I assume the coupes are more desirable but I've always had a soft spot for a soft top so to me I'd rather have this than the coupe but the coupe looks really nice and anyone who's got a coupe and who's had it for a while going to be in for a, a treat if they ever wish to sell it because they I think they go about 25k upwards so these are still sort of hovering around the sort of late teens maybe early 20s for a really nice example which of course this is but that's irrelevant because I wouldn't sell it absolutely love it to bits so yeah so Z4M Roadster what's it all about well Z4M Roadster has the engine out of the M3 which as most of you will know is the straight six 3.2 litre out of the E46 M3. So fantastic engine, absolute cracking engine. Um, had fantastic reviews. And they put it in the Z4, um, gave it to M Division. And to me, at the time, it was probably the only car I considered buying. I don't think I actually test drove anything else. 338 horsepower from the M3 engine. It actually has the setup of the CSL, um, so CSL brakes, um, suspension. Um, hasn't got all the trickery technological stuff that some of the other M cars have had of the same era and obviously more recently. Um, it's got a standard hydraulic steering as opposed to the electrically assisted steering on some of the M cars. I can't adjust the suspension or the dampers, the manual gearbox. But that's what I love about it. It's a it's a roadster. Two seats, front engined, rear wheel drive, manual gearbox, normally aspirated engine. To me that is a recipe for perfection. Now one of the best things about the Z4M Roadster is the noise it makes out of the M3 engine. I never quite fully understand why the Z4M Roadster and the Coupe were not more popular at the time. Because the M3, okay, it's always had a following, and I guess die-hard BMW enthusiasts have always tended to focus on the M3 as the ideal performance car. But this has the M3 engine, it's a CSL setup, 
it was quicker around the Nürburgring than the M3. So why why was it not popular at the time? I don't know. I'm biased. I absolutely love it. There's nothing more than putting it in sport mode, changing down, and putting your foot down. And it peaks 340 brake horsepower at 7,900 RPM. I mean, what car nowadays peaks at 7,900 RPM? I mean, the engine just loves to be revved. <laughs> and I treat it gently because she's my pride and joy, so I probably haven't ventured up to 7,900 RPM. I probably never had that benefit of that power out of this car. But to me, I love it. I love the raspiness, that metallic noise you get. It's just naturally aspirated. There's no trickery. There's no there's no um, synthesised noise in the cabin, which I'm, I'm not against, but you just don't need it in this. You get pure induction noise, which is fantastic. I love it. Now, I think what we need to do now is we cannot drive a convertible on a day like today without having the roof down. And this roof will not go when you're driving along, unlike some more modern day convertibles. So fortunate enough, it's quick enough to do at a junction. <laughs> and I've already caught up with a Corsa in front. <laughs> the sport button on this just, I think really all the sport button does is lightens the throttle response and you can easily forget you've got it in sport mode and you get into town and you pull away from a junction where all of a sudden the revs are screaming up and everyone's looking around and you thinking look at that bloody idiot driving like a you know lunatic but so I don't actually have sport mode on that often but if you're in for a really spirited drive and you've got a good road it is quite nice to put it on because you just get that extra sensitivity out of the accelerator which is nice I think it helps with the noise a bit as well, which is great. The gearbox is brilliant on this car. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's typical of both BMWs. Um, some people don't like them, some people aren't used to them. They can be a bit bouncy in the lower gears. But this has always been fantastic, absolutely brilliant. Just drop it down to second, get a bit of distance from me and the 1.2 course in front. Sunny days are meant for convertibles and exhaust noise. All I need now is an empty road, which I'm not going to get. Once it stays dry, I'll be happy. I might need fuel actually. It's one of the things I always forget to do when I get in a car I haven't driven for a while is look at the fuel gauge. It will, what? Did I ever did I leave it empty? No, the quarter of a tank is fine. It's fine, it's okay. That is other one with the other my bugbears about people buying diesel cars nowadays. I understand, okay, if you do loads of miles, if you do 15,000 miles a year plus, it makes sense, I know it does. But a lot of people do less mileage than that, and they buy the diesel car, which costs them more. I know diesel prices come down, it's not far off the same as petrol now, but most modern day petrol cars are actually very economical. And this, which I don't think you'd call modern day perhaps now, I'm still, I'm still getting, what am I getting? I'm getting 25 to the gallon out of it, and I'm not even trying. So some people might say I'm driving like a pussy to get 25 mpg out of it, but I'm not. I could drive this so much more economically, and I'm getting 25 out of it. And if you, I had an M135 recently, BMW, and I was getting 35 to the gallon out of a three litre petrol engine that I could drive out at the weekend with my hot hatch and have an amazing drive in it. And then during the week, I could just drive gently in it. I'm getting like mid thirties. Absolutely brilliant. You can't do that in a diesel. Not most of the diesels I've driven anyway. So anyone listening to this, who's a petrol head and who's doing less than 15,000 miles a year and has got a diesel set on their drive, just think about it before you buy your next car. There are a lot of economical petrol engines that if driven sensibly as your daily car will give you amazing fun on the weekend and economy, very respectable economy in the week. So what are the running costs of a Z4M Roadster that's now 10 years old? Well, they're not bad. The killer to be honest is the road tax which is now 500 quid uh, and that seems to come around quicker and quicker every year but road tax aside, economies absolutely fine unless you're doing ridiculous mileage and if you have it like me as your sort of Sunday fun car then don't even worry about it 
Uh, servicing, yeah, servicing can be expensive. Um, it's not annual, um, although I think they recommend an oil change every every 12 months. Uh, I actually haven't done that. I've tended to sort of have it serviced every couple of years. My car's got a full BMW service history. But I think if you're looking to buy one of these, or you want something fun for the weekend, I mean, for 15 grand, I mean, you, you could probably get a really good example for 15,000 quid. And yes, you can go down the Boxster route, and I've got a Boxster, and I love them, so I'm not going to suggest that that's not a great car as well. But this is a very different car. You get in a Boxster, and you can drive it flat out, and it flatters your ego. You get in this, you've actually got to think about what you're doing. It's not, it's not got the perfect weight distribution. You know, it's a bit of a handful if you're driving it quick. It'll catch you out. Uh, I'm not the world's best driver, but actually I quite like the fact that it's not perfectly composed. You get in it, it's got some theatre. You put your foot, foot down, the back twinges, the front comes up, and you actually got to think about what you're doing. And I love that. And I think certainly if you're having this as a, or thinking about getting a, a roadster for your fun car or your Sunday car, I would seriously consider checking out the ad, the classifieds for, some, for a really good example one as he's got a full BMW service history or a BMW specialist service history. And really, I don't, I don't think you're going to be uh, suffering too much on the maintenance side. I mean, a, a, an annual oil change isn't going to be expensive. Um, a, a, a service every couple of years, depending on where you have it done, might be sort of three, four hundred quid. I think the inspection too is about six hundred quid, which I've had done on this. Yeah, that can be, that, that's expensive. Um, but it's not every year. So I think if you sort of amortise the cost over a car that you'd have to get serviced every year, or if you've got one of these cars like a GTR or something that has, has to be serviced every 6,000 miles, then you know, you're going to find for, a, for a, you know, a fun car you know, that gives you this sort of performance, the costs really are no real different to anything else. It's, it's, it's the road tax that's the killer, 500 quid a year. Insurance isn't particularly bad, depends on your age. I mean, I'm in my 30s now, so insurance is 400 quid a year or something without any claims. Please, whatever you do, do not go out and buy a roadster without driving one of these things. I promise you, you'll not be disappointed. Whether you choose it or not is a matter of personal preference, but I guarantee you'll not get in it and hate it. Ultimate over there. Yeah. It's fine. She's good on 95. Definitely not diesel. So full tank on this is 55 litres. It's gonna give me a range, total range of 375 miles, which that is brilliant. I can't stand cars with small tanks. 375 miles is great. I mean who who wants to do more than 200 miles without stopping on a UK road anyway? So yeah, it's got a good tank. It's not the most economical, econ economical car in the world, but 25 mpg, I think it's quite respectable. I've actually had 30 out of it, no problem. So. But we're not worried about mpg. Not on days like today. I think Maserati call it smiles per mile. I quite like, so that's what we measure. 